Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of Revit Pure Live. I am your host Nicolas Catelier. I am an architect, a BIM specialist and the founder of Revit Pure. We've got a great episode for you guys tonight. I'm glancing in the chat. Uh, we've got Jay from Belgium. We've got uh, Faust from LA. Uh, what else? We've got Dania from Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, John from Treasure Coast, Florida. Ning from Vancouver. <clears throat> And Rowell from the Philippines and Daryl from Montgomery. So keep saying where you're from. I love uh, seeing viewers from all, all around the world. All right. So thank you to our sponsor once again, which is Avail. Uh, thanks to Avail for sponsoring Revit Pure Live. And Avail is a content management platform. Lots of firms I'm working with are struggling to organize their content, including system families, loadable families, drafting views, schedule images, URLs, anything. And Avail is introducing new ways to connect you to the information you need faster. Uh, Avail is an information management platform that answers the question, where do I find this? Don't you get that question as a BIM manager? And uh, with Avail, you can uh, reduce the amount of time you get that question. Uh, the content can be stored in both the network or in the cloud, so it gives you the choice. Some people prefer the cloud, some people prefer network. And you can see that you can use multiple cloud platforms, uh, Google Drive, um, uh, OneDrive, uh, SharePoint, and many others. Um, it has an appealing and customizable appearance, as you can see here. And now they introduced a new feature called Key Cards with the brand new release of Avail, and it's a better visual experience inside of channels, and it's dynamically organized grouping based on the tags. It's a, a data-driven experience. So what this means is that you can assign tags to content. So for example, specific tag to a door family or specific details. And then it's a bit like you can do in Revit, right? Where you can uh, filter a schedule only using placing certain doors, certain elements that contains a specific tags. Uh, it's similar with Avail. You have, you could call them smart folders, but it's a new feature called the keycard editor. And you can, you can fully customize the appearance uh, to get the keycard uh, look and flow customizable for a faster, more natural browsing experience. <clears throat> uh, let's talk about the cloud hosted content. Uh, introducing the cloud solved a lot of old problems for content management, but it also brought new problems, especially when it comes uh, to the path. Uh, lack of consistent firm-wide location for files, as you can see here, when using specific uh, path, for example, Autodesk Docs, you, you might get issues from one, other to, from one user to another. Avail introduced a dynamic path. It removes the complexity by letting Avail handle the padding that changes from one user to another. So uh, all users can, can use, uh, Autodesk Docs or other cloud platforms. This is also compatible with OneDrive, SharePoint, Google Drive, and it determined uh, each provider's strategy and dynamically resolve it, uh, just like this. So you don't have any broken path problems uh, when you organize your content. And the final new feature uh, in the new version of Avail, you can now harvest materials from Revit models, and then you can have this is much better than the default uh, Autodesk material library. And you can drag and drop materials from the Avail browser to your project. So if you struggle to organize your material, I know you do. Uh, Avail is a great solution for that. Uh, just drag and drop. So firms that struggle with content management, I see them all the time. Most of my clients have tr trouble with that. And with Avail, you can get the information you need uh, faster. So you can go to getavail.com or I will drag and drop, copy and paste this link into the chat. <clears throat> uh, right there, I hope you guys see it. If you want to have, if you want to try Avail, there's a free trial. And you can also get uh, a discount if you are a Rivet Pure watcher. So thanks to Avail for sponsoring the Rivet Pure Live. It's a great product, so make sure to have a look. And before moving on with the guests, something else that I wanted to talk about. So you might have noticed that the common theme 
of all the episodes of the live season so far are all about uh, families. I've been super interested in families. I've been working on really high advanced families in the last couple of months and last couple of years. And I can announce or almost announce I'm working on a cohort based course. What that means is that uh, it will be uh, 25 students together uh, for about two to three weeks in four live sessions and in a community where all users can work together to create amazing families. And I plan to teach about the formulas inside families using arrays, shared and nested families, mastering uh, their family editor user's interface and preparing the, the family for the end user. So if you're interested, I'm still figuring out the detail. Right now, my plan is to launch this at uh, late November. If you're interested, there's a form you can fill up. Uh, I still have questions. I'm wondering what people really want to learn about families. And if you fill up this form, you'll get on, on the wait list. And then it gives, gives me a hint of what people want from this course. So I'll also copy and paste the link in the chat. So if you're interested, take that. It's a really short survey. It should take about two minutes. All right, almost done with all of these announcements. And uh, finally, last week, we've released a brand new pamphlet and a brand new blog post about uh, Revit groups. So if you're interested, if you're doing multifamily projects or uh, modular constructions, Revit groups are great for that. And I've included full instructions on how you can use Dynamo to automate groups, especially when it comes to numbering scheduling for if you're for example you want to schedule every single thing included inside of a group uh, and a group can represent uh, an apartment for example you can use the power of dynamo and groups for that so that's currently the latest blog post on revit pure website okay that's it uh, that's it for the little announcements thanks for bearing with me um We've got someone from uh, Georgia that stayed the country and from Baltimore, somebody else from Quebec City. Good to hear. It's a rainy day here in Quebec City. All right. Uh, today's guest is Benjamin Gluntz. Benjamin is based in Illinois in the US. He is the founder and CEO at Angularis a BIM content strategy expert company that has well-known products such as BIM Smith and Swatchbox. <clears throat> He's been doing that since 2010. And before that, Ben used to work as a BIM manager. Uh, there you go. So welcome yeah. to the show, Ben. Thanks for having me, Nick. Uh, thanks for coming. All right. So I'll, I'll ask the same question I ask most of my guests. How did you get interested <laughs> in BIM? Sure. So for a lot of people, you get your first taste of Revit or BIM in, in college. Uh, so for me, that was definitely the case. Um, before Revit had a ribbon, uh, <laughs> so that gives you any context. Uh, but first was using SketchUp, and then uh, a friend of mine in college said, hey, you really need to look at Revit. It's way better. <laughs> and so uh, I never went back. And so I did everything I could to learn everything about Revit that I could uh, through those college years, graduate research uh, on Revit and, and been my thesis, uh, and then got a job uh, at a firm uh, helping them make the conversion from AutoCAD to Revit. And so uh, that's, that's really how I got my start. And, uh, you know, I can remember having arguments with professors back in university days about you know, whether or not this was going to be the way the industry would go and, and whatnot. And uh, glad to see that it did and, and that many of those professors were wrong. <laughs> so uh, here we are today. Yeah, kind of, kind of similar for me. I, I think uh, many people just stumble upon BIM, you know. Uh, it's not how did you find BIMs or how did BIM find you? Yeah, in, exactly. In, in a lot of cases. So how long ago did you uh, start Angularis or uh, BIM Smith? Yeah, sure. So the company Angularis uh, is really just a parent company for BIM Smith and, and as you said, Swatchbox and now Modeler.com as well. <clears throat> but uh, really got started in 2010 
when my co-founder, uh, Freddie Munoz, who's now our CTO, uh, we were sitting at the same firm together working on uh, projects and were really frustrated with the lack of manufacturer content that was out there at the time. And, uh, you know, back and forth, as you do in an office, you say, hey, we, we really ought to just do this. And so uh, at the time, there were manufacturers coming in to present to us and do lunch and learns and things like that. And so we would start reverse pitching them. Well, why don't you have Revit families? <laughs> so they'd come to pitch their product and we would pitch uh, ours right back. And so it was kind of a funny way to get started. Uh, but as things evolved, we certainly saw, you know, that there was a need. And uh, even though manufacturers at the time had no idea what BIM or Revit were or really even cared, um, the more traction we got, the more potential we saw to help solve this problem. So uh, that's that's really where we got started. Just a couple of nerds uh, laughing over their cups of coffee uh, at an architectural office. Yeah, and first, did you approach uh, uh, manufacturers to help them create their companies? How did that uh, How did that work? Yeah, you know, at first it was really challenging. I remember that first year, I think we got one client because <laughs> uh, nobody was even understanding what we were talking about. Uh -huh, yeah. and, and maybe we were just bad salespeople, but it was also, you know, very early on that a lot of firms were still living in CAD. And uh, even that first client that we got, I'm pretty sure they just signed uh, a contract with us just to shut us up because we were bugging <laughs> them so much. Um, but then we got started to get some more serious customers. I'll, I'll never forget uh, Florence Manufacturing, uh, who makes complex mail uh, systems for the USPS. Uh, they were one of the first customers who really got it um, for mm -hmm. us in terms of understanding the real potential um, and so we'll, we'll never forget them as kind of uh, one of the first manufacturers to invest heavily in uh, having a good BIM strategy. And we, we didn't even know to call it a BIM strategy back then. I don't know that we were even talking about BIM managers back then. But uh, nonetheless, as uh, we went out and started talking to more and more manufacturers, uh, got some real momentum. Obviously, when Autodesk Seek started to get its wings, uh, we were one of the uh, a couple of firms that were selected by them to build content back in those days. So, so obviously all of us coming out and telling manufacturers that was another big boost to our industry in, in terms of getting manufacturers to take this really responsibility seriously in terms of uh, seeing Revit content as a viable tool to, to give building product data and get it into the project more efficiently. So that's really what we view it as. What is the the biggest problem or the most frequent problem uh, with manufacturer manufacturer families? Yeah, you know, it, our our job, uh, you know, here I'll speak for for Bim Smith. Our job is to kind of bridge the gap between the manufacturers and folks like us who have been in practice mm -hmm. or are in practice. Um, inevitably, the architect is saying, just give me the dumbest, stupidest, quickest, lightest model possible, and I'll just throw it in there, right? But then the manufacturer is saying, but wait, I have all this great data, and I have all of these great features, and I need to have a decal put on the side of the model. And, and that's a story we can tell some, some time later in the, the broadcast. But you know, the requests we get, so we, we have to balance that tension to make sure we're not overbloating the model, but that we're also still representing the interest of the group that's paying for the content mm -hmm. to be done, because they do have a lot of good data and they do have a lot of relevant data. And so all the while you have um, people in the industry who have come in at different points. If you came in in 2006, you have a very different impression of uh, what a computer or a Revit model can handle than somebody who's coming in now. Hardware is accelerating year over year, which means you know Revit is able to handle more and more. And so you know with the improvements that were made in the 2018, 2019 releases of Revit, where we're not literally re-rendering every view in the whole model, you know that was a, a big advancement. Um, but there are preconceived notions in the industry, well, we can never use that content, it's too heavy, or it's too this, or it's too that. And so it, it just keeps coming back to that balancing of what is the value you're bringing into the model? What are your goals for the project? Are you in schematic design? 
Or are you a facility manager who wants to know the ins and outs of an actual uh, built uh, structure? So, you know, you have these different stakeholders, you have different end uses for the model. Uh, and we have the, the pleasure as a, a group to help educate manufacturers on how to meet people where they are and the needs that they have. Mm -hmm. Sure. So you, you talk about performance. Um, so you said Rivet has improved performance since a few release, but on your side, what are the steps that you take to try yeah. to have uh, performant families? Yeah, so we, like many other content providers, uh, have stepped up to, to really make this uh, a serious um, concern. And you know, I know you have the folks from Vim Content are on earlier, I think maybe last week. Um, you know, they also take that very seriously. I'd say the two of us are really leading the charge on that. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad to have uh, <laughs> some Aussie partners in crime mm -hmm. uh, to really raise the bar. You know, other places, they, they don't really care so much about the, the quality of the content. Um, everything that goes on Bimsmith uh, has to pass a, a 40 to 50 point inspection, depending on what type of content it is. Uh, whether we make it or not, uh, it has to meet that. So. Um, we feel that if we allow content that's poorly con constructed to, to get on there, and you know, there's always exceptions. There are manufacturers who come with a, you know, all sorts of content in terms of all levels of, of, you know, finish. But as a rule, we try to make sure that everything that we build or have full control over building uh, is using the best practices, not only that. Uh, myself and my team have from actually working in practice. 50% of our Bimsmith team comes from you know, either architecture, design, construction. So we've all been there. We've all been in the shoes of the end user. So we try to constantly be distilling that experience into the way we build the content to make sure that not only is it built the way we would have wanted it built five years ago, but also as things change, like hardware acceleration, like better software, uh, even, you know, better cloud tools um, that were staying up to date with that. And there's nothing written in stone that it will be that way forever. You know, just at any moment in time, we're doing the best we can to to suit the needs of the, the BIM managers and the firms that rely on our, our content every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's no coincidence that you, you came in uh, shortly after BIM content because I, I did write a pamphlet, which is a short PDF guide about families a few, a few months ago. And I did, right. usually it's it's kind of good advice to avoid some manufacturer's content, but uh, BIM Smith and BIM content are two websites <laughs> that I would, I actually recommend because I know they do have a checklist, <laughs> which is, doesn't seem to be the case sometimes with uh, uh, some of these websites. I, I'm wondering, is, is this public information or can you give us kind of a preview of what is included in that checklist? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, if you look at really the source document for us and a lot of the people who really care about content, uh, since there hasn't been a massive effort worldwide to standardize content, mm -hmm. really many of us point back to some of the best practices that were created in the Autodesk Seek days. Um, mm -hmm. There's the Autodesk Revit Model Content Style Guide, which is, a, a mouthful it's a horrible name for a document but it you know and it's not i wouldn't say it's not 100 percent right um it was right for its time when it was written but a lot of the good best practices go back to uh some of the things that bimcontent.com shared last week and i know the uh the australia and new zealand content standard points back to that as well um so yeah. in a way it's what, also what's it, sorry what, what's the name of that i think i'll add it to the links if people want to which one? Uh, well, you mentioned something that dated back from uh, Seek. Oh, the, the Autodesk. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I can. Um, oh, you can share it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if there's a public link on it at this point, but I can. I can certainly dig that up and get it to you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah that would but, be interesting um, for you. You know, yeah. think, things like thinking through, uh, you know, file size and having a, a limit to that, and I, I think some of these things were actually covered last week, so it, it, it is mm -hmm. all from that same document, um, but. You know, we like to think that you shouldn't really ever build a model that's over a mech. There's really not a whole lot of reason to do that. Um, if you know what you're doing and you can uh, build an efficient family, there's really no reason to do that. Um, so one you know, megabyte so would be the limit. 
Yeah. And now if there's some particular reason, like it's a, a crazy piece of furniture that is going to be for high res, high poly renderings, you know, that kind of thing, um, maybe, but even then you shouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> um, we did get a submission for, uh, we have a, uh, uh, our Christmas competition that we do every year that you were a judge at. Uh, so thank you for doing that. Um, <clears throat> but the year before you participated, we had a submission that came in at 45 megs. Yeah, we yeah. didn't even open the file um, <laughs> because we just knew that it was a, a horrible idea. Right? <laughs> so, you know, there, there are some crazy things out there, but if you're building efficiently, you know, there, there shouldn't be a need to do that. Yeah. The it, is to, you know, yeah. really make sense of your formulas in a way that, you know, you're not showing off. Um, uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> a, a lot of content creators like to just show off by writing these crazy formulas and having all these extra parameters. But if you're really a master of parameter building and building in uh, formulas, you shouldn't have to do that. So there are a lot of really elegant methods that are out there, uh, some of which are documented online, some of which we have in our blog. Um, we actually have a, a whole blog article just on how we write formulas. Yeah, do you want to share that? Yeah, we can we can definitely share that. Yeah, if it's um, your screen now. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can pull that up. So this is a great resource. Uh, if you go to blog.bimsuit.com, we write uh, a number of tutorials and things like that. Um, so if you click on the Revit tab, there's all kinds of um, you know, fun stuff here. Um, so for example, here is one that's specifically just dedicated to rotational parameters, which can be a whole other thing, right? And so we've got this great little video here, uh, tutorial that's embedded into that. So I would certainly uh, recommend that um, as a resource. And then let's see. There's one on Revit material libraries. Uh, here's a basic intro to Revit families and type catalogs. Complex wall types, parametric arrays. That's another really uh, good deep dive uh, that we do. Um, so that, that that's a lot of fun if you have a few minutes to watch that one. Um, adaptive components, uh, which we use for things like skylights and some furniture. We also have the guide to Revit family creation there, and I think the formulas are actually covered in that one. There's one on constraints. Um, so I, I would say uh, these are some great places to go uh, to, to look at some of this. Um, but back to your point in terms of like what makes up good content, we also publish this, which sort of mirrors some of the things that are uh, talked about in the, the content style guide. So it's Revit Families 101. So if people want to Google that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's Bim Smith, Revit Families 101. Um, and so you can see here talking about, uh, you know, we don't want to have warnings. We don't have a, want to have this like one of 20 sort of yeah. error message, right? <laughs> Uh, making sure that you're constraining it properly so that it's not going to fly apart, but also you're not over constraining it because stuff happens in projects and you need to make modifications uh, sometimes. So uh, intuitive parameters being a key thing, uh, standard types or type catalogs. Anytime over we have over six uh, types, we tend to do a type catalog just because we don't want to bloat that family. Uh, this particularly becomes relevant with lighting families which we have, I believe, one of the largest lighting libraries in the world mm -hmm. uh, with thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands of uh, lighting web families. So you can certainly check that out as well uh, by going to bimsmith.com slash lighting. Uh, but building in IES files so that it renders properly and doing the hard work of setting up, you know, all the, the parameters. We, uh, we did a we did a piece called No More Studio Lights, and I think that was actually a class at AU or uh, at Built uh, that got in. Um, so if you go to the Built website, I think you can see some of that. But uh, Eli from our group uh, is really passionate about lighting, and that's his thing. Like, stop pumping your project full of studio lights. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's some really great content that's actually set up with the correct voltage, wattage, yeah. wattage you know, color, color temperature, 
you know, the actual IES file is built in and tied to the correct types. You know, so there's a lot of great stuff. Uh, a lot of firms assume that the content that is out there is still garbage because there are still sites out there that just throw anything up there. Mm -hmm. They throw up, you know, garbage models, but then also uh, photos from their interns trip to Cancun. We don't, we don't know what's up there, right? So <laughs> <laughs> anything can get up there, but you know, with our site, it's all curated. So it, part of our job is to educate the industry to say there is a lot of really high quality content out there and you can actually make your firm's job a lot easier because if you're using actual manufacturer content, you can actually tie that into specifications as well. And we're building content in a way that it's compatible with tools like MasterSpec from AIA to make sure that you're saving your spec writers some uh, time and frustration and that uh, you know it's getting beyond just the technical aspects of, you know, can you slam some Revit families into this model uh, to actually helping to drive the design process with real uh, products. Um, so yeah, this is a, a great article. Um, you know, we always want to see materials. We want to see them tied to parameters so that they can be changed. Mm -hmm. uh, using type and instance correctly, using shared parameters correctly, not all the time. Um, you know, so this is a, this is a great uh, resource to take a look at. Um, and obviously there are other things too. Yeah, what was the point about masking region? I, I know that was uh, uh, one of the last points of the article I saw but about Yeah, masking region. so the, the thing about masking regions, uh -huh. uh, you know, there was a, an old rule that Autodesk had that had said anything in plan or elevation has to be fully masked. Uh -huh. And it was just completely unnecessary and over the top, but because Autodesk was writing the rules back then, talking 2016, 2017, you know, mm -hmm content creators like us had to appease them. Now we, we've since gotten away from that to only do it when it makes sense, mm -hmm. right? So if you have something that you want to show a symbol, right? Like an architectural graphic standard symbol, it makes sense to do a masking region or some sort of line. Uh, you know, a door is a great example. You don't want to literally show a 3D door slab in a, a floor plan. You want to say a, a nice swing. Uh, a window would be another great example where you're managing the appropriate coarse, medium, and fine uh, LOD for uh, what shows up in plan, what shows up in elevation. Um, areas where it doesn't make sense to use masking is when geometry is simple enough on its own or accurate to the way it needs to show up in graphic standards. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who have been to architectural school, or, or maybe not, but there's, there's great resources out there called architecture graphic standards. And so we, we try to look at that and say, like, what has the... Uh, legacy of the architecture profession they've come up with really efficient ways to show certain products and certain product types so how can we uh, add to that tradition rather than just completely wiping it out resulting in really muddy line work from over modeled families you know how can we do elegant uh 2d representations that represent what's shown in 3d all the while making those families perform better yeah, we've got a, a, a comment from uh, Scar DX about that. He says, uh, masking is pointless in 2022. In the old days, uh, you need it because Revit is on 32 bits and performance yeah, initially. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I guess the... Ex yeah, okay, that's interesting. And so I guess the, the idea is if you... Unless you have like a crazy complex geometry with lots of polygons and mesh, in that case, maybe it's worth putting a masking region to simplify some of that. But yeah. if you have kind of a simple... Uh, I don't know, a shell for something like that. Doesn't make sense. Yeah, That's right. Uh, another great example of masking might be like a, a toilet or a water closet, right? Yeah, if yeah. you are bringing in a model and it's got a weird shape and it's like yep. this fancy toilet, you don't need to show every line on the toilet the way it would be modeled. So showing just a simple outline of the toilet, yeah. you actually want to trace it and make it dimensionally accurate. That's mm -hmm. another pet peeve of mine is when you show something in symbolic lines that isn't dimensionally accurate to what's actually going to be placed. Because then you start to get uh, arguments between your elevation and plan views where the dimensions don't line up. So I don't mm -hmm. recommend that at all. Um, the other area I've seen it is with some furniture, like a chair. You know, you might start to see the curve lines because Revit has the, you know, shows too many lines in the curves of the seat or something like that. It might make sense, but I'd say more often than not, it makes a lot of sense to just use the actual geometry the main reason to, to mask, in my opinion, is when you're trying to keep the, the line work from getting overly muddy. Um, and essentially, that's what's happening. Revit is masking the wall. When you go to a course view, 
it's really just masking those layers, right? So, you know, it's the same sort of concept. Sure, yeah. Um, there's a few questions, but I think it would be interesting to show the, the, the BIM Smith uh, interface, if you can uh, do a, a quick tour, perhaps. And I've been uh, playing around with the site and one of the things I've noticed is there was, of course, lots of manufacturers content, but I've also noticed some uh, what they call generic content, which I thought was pretty interesting as well. Can you talk yeah, about that? Yeah. yeah, sure. So the generic content project is something that we, um, you know, we do based on requests of users. So um, in general, our rules for generics are we're not going to model something that we have manufactured content for. So, mm -hmm. for example, you're in your show promo, you had the hammock. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could be wrong. Maybe there's a hammock manufacturer out there. They're going to call us tomorrow, hopefully, because they heard about us on this show. But, you know, for now, you know, we were getting a lot of requests. Hey, do you have a model for a hammock? So we put our content ninjas to work and, and they made one. Okay, can you um, can you show uh, show the hammock just in the preview? Yeah. So just the way fun. that you would find this, uh, mm -hmm. it, you wouldn't know this is here. It's going to show up in your searches. So in a, in a way, it's a bit of an Easter egg. But if you go in and search Bim Smith generics, uh, it's going to pull up our collection of generics. Now, uh, because you brought up the Christmas competition, I did turn on the Christmas content, so it will be kind of laced in here as well uh, with it as well as some of our other seasonal Easter eggs like the Guinness Pint. Uh, by the way, the Guinness Pint is <laughs> one of our most successful uh, LinkedIn posts ever uh, really? <laughs> shared uh, over a thousand times uh, across the globe. So cheers to all of you who shared the Guinness Pint this St. Patrick's <laughs> Day. Um, but you can see just some of the things that aren't typically going to be maybe manufacturer ready. Um, but we do have these here. Um, so let's see. So I think you shared about the, the treadmill, um, you know, we have the elliptical, but you know, these are just things that people are asking for that, uh, you know, whether it's entourage or just a bit of fun, uh, you know, we have it available. Yeah. 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 I like that you turn on the, the, the Christmas families. <laughs> so I'll, yeah, I should create a few renderings with uh, the sleigh and the snowman. <laughs> Yeah, so we uh, not only have Christmas uh, stuff from the competition, but we also have stuff that our team made. So, you know, some of these, like this one, I, I love. I think this is so cool. So this is actually a scale model of the uh -huh. McAllister residence from Home Alone made into a gingerbread house. So we had an internal competition, you know, and oh, that cool. actually won the internal competition. Um, but then, uh, you know, in addition to that, we have our winners from past years. Yeah, the snowflakes. I, I saw it. Yeah, the snowflakes are there. Um, let's see, we've got the snow globe. Uh, those of you know John Pearson. Uh, he did the holiday storage tote one year, which you know was pretty cool. It opens and closes, and you can make plans in your attic. How many how many storage totes can you fit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so all all sorts of stuff there. But yeah, go ahead and download these. These are these are great uh, as well. I think this was the first place winner the first year we did the competition. Yeah, finalist. And uh, there's also a video here so you can watch that of, you know, all of these uh, families in action. So it's kind of fun. Okay. Uh, what are, are the most challenging families to create? I, I know from my point of view, like doors and windows are the most requested. Um, uh, the ones I probably have the most trouble finding uh, high quality, let's say, standards that people can use in early stage. Turn not too detail. What do you yeah. think about that? Yeah, doors and windows are always a challenge, and they often have a really negative stereotype because when you look at the, I'll be a historian here in terms of manufacturer content, doors and windows were the first to jump in. So that means the first generation of the, that content is usually the worst, right? <laughs> but, uh, unfortunately, doors and windows got a really bad reputation uh, early on for, you know, frankly, exactly what you showed in your pamphlet, that, that window family that yeah. you <laughs> so eloquently shredded. Uh, we didn't make that. It's not on our site, but, um, you know, point well taken. But there are a lot of uh, manufacturers that are catching wise to this and, you know, completely rebuilding their libraries from the ground up. Um, so, you know, I would say that's the challenge about doors and windows is you have to be so much more careful because there is so much more garbage out there to sift through. 
Um, whereas uh, newer categories like finishes, you know, we a lot of finishes were not, you know, people didn't really put the time into modeling. Uh, really, only in 2016 or 17 did we start modeling uh, paint libraries. Um, and the reason that we see this uh, increase in usage of finishes uh, is that with the rise of tools like Enscape and other real-time mm -hmm. uh, rendering engines, it, as architects, we're more and more showing clients, like, this is what it's actually going to look like. So gone are the days where you can throw up a quick render and say, hey, it's a wood floor. I think it's going to look something like this. It mm -hmm. looks so realistic now that you actually, you know, clients are pushing our, yeah. our architecture firms who use Brimsmith to show the real finish. So that's where you'll see stuff like Armstrong ceiling or, you know, actual flooring companies or, you know, PPG paint number X, Y, Z, right? Because it's, it's becoming so much more literal because we're losing that stylistic interpretation that we used to be able to just kind of throw it up and say, well, it's just a rendering, but the rendering engines are so good now that people take them so literally that that then means we have to turn around and be a lot more literal in the way that we're uh, representing product and specification choices. Yeah, totally. And uh, many, especially older families, uh, especially door and, and windows and others, like they look fine. And then when you go to realistic or to renderings, they don't really have textures or they, uh, yeah, the appearance right. as asset is not set up. Yeah. That's a big problem. So whenever I work on manufacturer content, I insist, like try to make put a real JPEG in there, make a real material. So it's ready for architects. Architects will be pretty happy about that. Yeah, right. You know, m making broad statements about manufacturer content, you know, it, it's just as diverse as going mm -hmm. uh, to, to an Italian restaurant. You could go to a fine Italian restaurant uh, in Rome and have the best pasta of your life. Or you could go to Joe's Pasta Shack down the street or, or uh, you know, I like Olive Garden. I like the breadsticks. But my point is, you know, there's a broad spectrum and yeah, yeah. you get what you're what you're looking for, right? So if you look for high quality Revit content from manufacturers, you're gonna find that. If you grab it from just anywhere, then it's it's luck of the draw, right? So that's the other thing that is something we're always working with firms to kind of debunk this common misconception uh, about manufacturer content. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I always point out to you guys when I work with clients. Yeah, because th there's a common advice among BIM managers that um, when people ask, where should I find families? The answer, answer should be, well, you must build your own family from scratch. Yeah, you should never use any content online. It's like, that's kind of nuts. Uh, maybe in a big firm that I can understand it, but like there's a lot of like small residential architects, for example, or just small yeah. firms, they don't have the resource to build all their own content. They might build a few families, but to expect them to build every single thing, it's pretty crazy and doesn't make sense in their industry too. Yeah, and that that's so much so true. And it's not even just limited to the smaller firms. We're finding that yeah. the larger mm -hmm. firms are even coming around now too. Sure, yeah. Realize, yeah, we may have been able to build an initial set of generic libraries, right? But then maintaining that and keeping it up and making sure it's consistent with the products that are on the market becomes another whole endeavor. And within five to 10 years, that library can be completely obsolete. And so that's why we were having conversations with all of the big firms. Uh, you know, fun fact, 99 out of the, the top 100 firms in the United States uh, have used Bimsmith and, and are really cool. Bimsmith. We won't name that one, but we will get you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you know, they're using it too. It's not just the small mom and pops. And we are having conversations with the big guys about how how we can yeah. effectively, you know, all our tools are free. So that's the great thing about us. Yeah. We're not really selling to firms. We're just here to say, hey, will you use these resources that somebody's else already paid to, to develop for you? Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we're integrating and, and talking to folks like Avail about how uh, to get that content into uh, into those workflows more seamlessly, right? Yeah, yeah. And to build those connections. But uh, a lot of the big firms are using it. And, and then we start to talk about tools like our, our Bimsmith Forge tool, you know, that's even more unique because you can build, you know, generic right. and manufacturer specific uh, assemblies there. But um, using generic content is, uh, is a bit of a liability. If you don't 
have a plan to swap it out or get in and specify later with more specific content, it can open up problems. And that was actually one of the uh, stories that I'll, I'll tell here uh, that gave us the idea to start the company in the first place. Uh, Freddie and I were working on a, a very, 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 very expensive project that had a very clear specification for every product. And I took the time to model out uh, a very expensive, you're getting a theme here, big budget, uh, very expensive sink that had to go into the, to the room. And there were these vessel sinks that kind of sit above the countertop. So I modeled one of these and uh, put it in. And then a few days later, my boss came out and said, what are you doing? We don't have billable hours to make that kind of content. Why don't you just use the vanity sink that comes with the template? I said, well, it, it's square, first of all. Second of all, it's a vessel, so that changes the dimensions. Well, no, no, no. Take that out and put, put the vessel sink back in. So he, I took the time to model it, but he had me take it out and then put in this other generic family. And so funny enough, time went on six or seven months. We show up for one of the walkthroughs, and wouldn't you know it, the plumbing engineer found the Revit uh, vanity sink, that, round, that awful round sink that Revit comes with. He found a manufacturer that made it and adjusted the specs, and nobody on our side saw it, nobody on our side caught it, and they cut a hole through this very expensive countertop oh, wow. to get this sink through. And so all the sinks had to be ripped out, all the countertops had to be ripped out because it was a vessel sink. So they had to get a new countertop, put the correct sink on top. And if we had just left the darn sink from that manufacturer in there, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have been a problem and it would have mm -hmm. carried all the data for that engineer into the schedule and it wouldn't have been uh, an issue in the site. And so that was one of those things where we were just like, well, wow, if the manufacturer had just provided that in the first place, our boss wouldn't have gotten upset about us you know, wasting the time to make that specific model if we could have just downloaded it and put it in from the start. So there is liability baked into using generic content. Mm -hmm. And as content improves and as our computing power improves, there's really fewer and fewer reasons to use manufactured content. The key is to manage what you're bringing in, the quality, and then map it to the parameters in your processes internally. And there are lots of great, you know, add-ins and tools out there uh, you know, that you can use to manage parameters and, and map them properly to make sure uh, they're, they're getting used uh, in conjunction with what you're already doing uh, in your front. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, I think we should take a few questions and then it would be cool to see, uh, to see the, the crafting tool. Yeah, that'd be uh, great. The, the crafter, let's have a look at the questions. Uh, um... Uh, there was a question about Halloween content. Did you have, have that as well? I don't remember Halloween content. <laughs> you know, I don't think we've ever done any Halloween content, but uh, we definitely should. So if anybody wants to submit one, uh, I don't know, Nick, if there's an email they can send it to, uh, we'll, we'll put it up in our user section. So uh, There's a, a question from Rick or a comment about uh, uh, content created in Rhino. So how do you, do you work with multiple software? If uh, you have content existing in Rhino, do you just or make the whole thing from scratch in Revit? Do you, you sometimes work with imported geometry or never? Yeah, so nothing on our site has any imported geometry. Um, we have yet to find a workflow that gets us the results that we want uh, from that standpoint. So from our perspective, when we're creating content, we're tracing. Um, there are a lot of great little trips, uh, tics, yeah, tips and tricks that you can, you can follow to do that efficiently, um, but as it relates to Revit, we're, we're really sticking to native Revit geometry. Um, a lot of manufacturers will come to us and say, I've got SOLIDWORKS, I've got Pro-E, I've got this, that, and the other thing. And even if you could do a clean, straight conversion out of an engineering software, we're of the mindset that part of the process of redrawing in Revit is actually an interpretation of what should be drawn, mm -hmm. right? And we don't want every nut, bolt, and screw as of yet. Maybe we will in the next five to 10 years, who, who knows? But where, where the industry stands today, we don't need that level of intricacy. And so our team views that as an opportunity to translate what actually needs to be shown uh, in the construction documents or in the model itself um, to interpret the course medium and fine and to not over model uh, as you would be tempted to do through a direct import. 
Um, so that's that's really the main thesis behind our, our approach to that. Mm -hmm. There, uh, yeah, like that's what the Glenn from uh, BIM content said as well. Uh, uh, will BIM Smith allow user build content much like BIM Store or Modeler? Uh, they, they, they said that another set is a vetting process before they let you publish. Yeah, so right now we're not. That's something we've looked at doing. Um, the big trick for us is we want to be able to ensure the, the level of quality. We don't want to turn mm -hmm. into a Revit City. Mm -hmm. you know, Revit City is great. It has its its time and place, right, mm -hmm. for what you're doing. But that's uh, our big thing is the curation. And so until we find a way to consistently deliver curated content from users, uh, which we are looking at that, um, you know, we're not doing it right now. Now, we, we did acquire Modeler um last year or so we announced that in january so on that platform we are allowing it um because you know it's, it's a little bit of a different uh community over there but um you know open to what everybody has to say you know if you're interested in submitting user content let us know submit a ticket and, and let us know because uh if that's a value to the community then you know we certainly want to lean into that and find ways to make it work Good. There's a question from Milo that asks, is the content can be used uh, inter internationally for countries that use metric system and that feet in inches? Yeah. So one of the features that we really pioneered is this project location. So on some other sites, it's just kind of a global site where everything's puked into one bucket. Um, we are actually behind the scenes curating content by region. So you look here at this project location, it's going to detect where you are based on your IP address. So you can see I'm in the US. So it's actually serving me a US experience. Now, if you're visiting from out of the country, you know, put in your project location uh, because where you are is not necessarily where your project is. And that's a key distinguishing factor that we make on our tools is that the products that are available, if I'm designing a project in London from the US, I want to see products that are available in London. So there's active curation behind the scenes. So if a product is showing up based on your IP address, that means that it's available in your region. So it kind of peels back one extra layer of hard work that you have to do to see whether or not it's available in the region. Mm -hmm. And what if users want to use content just like, like for representation purpose or early stage, even if they don't necessarily plan to use this content, can they still uh, download it? Yes, of course. You can download it and you can use it. Um, it is set up by region. So, you know, uh, stuff that is available in Europe will be in metric and uh, okay. products that are available here in the U.S. Are yeah. What what about Canada? We use, we use both units here. <laughs> well, you can take your pick. <laughs> So, okay, so the technique, do you have both units or it really depends on the contents? So it depends on the depends. manufacturer. So if it's okay. a Canadian manufacturer, we'll make both available. Um, mm -hmm. It's really up to them whether they want to invest in both or whether they feel like enough of their market, you know, is suited to Imperial or Metric. Yeah, it's, it's a little weird here working with both units all the time. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 yeah, there's a question about uh, uh, LOD from ScoreDX. A lot of clients are asking for L LOD 350 to 400. Having simple shape Revit just doesn't cut it. So how do you decide uh, the, the level of detail you go with the families? Sure. So what we're advising most manufacturers to do is to start uh, providing content somewhere in the uh, up, up to 300 or 350. And to have a very specific reason for providing anything over 300. And more and more van manufacturers are getting calls for that. So we are seeing that. So um, you know, I'll give an example. Are you able to see my screen still, Nick? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this manufacturer is called Free Access. And uh, they make a floor access panel that you run across the whole floor of the building. Now, for them, they're doing a lot of uh, facility management work. They're doing all sorts of, um, you know, owner and contractor work. But then they're also getting designed in by design firms uh, around the world. So uh, what we've done for them is we provided a project package to start here. So this will give you a floor system family that just has a hatch pattern on it that will give you kind of a certain point. 
But then you'll also see we also have all the components. And so depending on the manufacturer's goal and what they're trying to achieve and what audiences they're uh, looking to hit, we will provide extra packages uh, if needed to go higher. Now for some content, we can get more specific. So for example, lighting, you're gonna have just one, one web family that's gonna be able to help you through all the different LODs um, versus a, a cladding company or, or a roofing company uh, where you're gonna, anytime you have those system families that are kind of layers, that kind of calls the question to, do we need to actually model something more specifically uh, for higher, higher LODs? But then we're also providing uh, details in, in many cases. So if we look here at uh, someone like Georgia Pacific, uh, you're gonna have not only the individual products that are modeled you know, to do very high LOD, um, but then you're also gonna have the system families or, or the forge uh, builds. So this is the BIM Smith forge tool that you can build the system family uh, using that. But then you're also going to have uh, the detail uh, elements available. So if we go in here to a product like Tough Rock, you can see these Revit native details are also available. So that's how you can start to close that gap. So we're, we're providing three kinds of content, the system family, the RFA that can be panelized and placed on an individual basis, and then the, the detail views, which can be inserted uh, through, through project uh, uh, transfer. And do you have a showroom projects or like container files with that uh, regroup this content? The, the what? The container file or a showroom uh, projects? Yeah, absolutely. So it depends on the manufacturer and what they want to provide. Uh, but this uh, that one from Free Access would be a great example of that, where we have the grid project. So when you open this up, it's actually showing you know, uh, a room, right? Where it's actually set up to, to show everything that's possible with that content library. Yeah, okay, I see. So uh, uh, that's good looking at the question. Well, I think we, okay, the, a quick one from Rick that says, Modler, Modler had a great tool called Moodboard. Will, will you bring that back? Yeah, we're currently working with the modeler team to kind of go through some of the backlog of their different features and bring those to light. So there's a lot of great stuff coming on that side of things. We're currently uh, revamping the product tagging within the photos. So we can look at that later too, but that's an effort to kind of reconstruct the DNA of uh, a photograph of an actual project and see the products that were actually tagged in that. So, uh, and then linking that either to a product page on Bimsmith, Modeler, or to order samples on, on swatchbox.com, which is our sampling uh, platform that we have. Good. I, I think you should show, uh, if, if you want, the, the, the Forge tool for system yeah. families. Can you? Yeah, uh, no, I'd be glad to. So, of that? so if you go back to the homepage of bimsmith.com, and a lot of people don't know this, but we actually started with the bimsmith forge tool. Mm -hmm. um, not to be confused with the formerly named Autodesk Forge tool, which yes. is more. <laughs> yeah, just changed the name, right? Yeah, so uh, we, we named it that long before Autodesk, so it has nothing to do with that, just to be clear. Uh, but you can see here, if you come into our site, you've got the search, which will take you into Ben Smith Market, or you can use the wall, floor, ceiling, or roof builder. And so that's, that's going to build out with our Forge tool. Um, and I've actually got one open here, so let me pull that over. So you can also go to forge.bimsmith.com. That's a, another spot where you can learn more about the tool uh, and see some short tutorials. So I'll pull that up too. So here you go, forge.bimsmith.com. And you can see all the things you can do here with this. And we're actually getting ready to launch a new build of this uh, in, in the next month or two uh, of the Forge tool. So that'll be really exciting. Um, new interface and a bunch of new functionality. So Stay tuned for that. But the basic premise be behind the Vim Smith Forge tools is that we're building content, uh, primarily system families, uh, from scratch uh, based on the different layers that come together. And we have these challenges with manufacturers like paint or drywall or studs or cladding uh, that we're trying to make families and put them out there, but they only made one of the layers. And so either they just made a single layer that was basically useless, or they put together an assembly and had to make, you know, we had one uh, container file that had 
1,500 wall types in it, and it took 20 minutes to open um, because it was just permutations of all the different things you could do. So that's the basic premise here. Uh, this is a, a tool that we created, um, and believe it or not, it is patented. Uh, so it's very unique in the industry uh, based on uh, what we've built here. But you can go in and uh, start to type different products. And so you can see it's going to guide me. And anytime that I have a manufacturer specific uh, product available, it's going to show that little factory icon. So if I choose metal studs, it's going to then guide me to the next decision, which which type of metal studs. OK, I'm going to say wall from them. And then within wall framing, what are some standard sizes? Now for our metric friends, we are still working on that. Um, we have that for some of the products, but not quite all of them yet. So stay tuned on that in the next release uh, to be available. So from here on, we're moving from generic considerations to manufacturer or real world uh, considerations. So at any point, you always have the option to choose generic if you're not ready to specify, but you can see I'll choose a brand and then it's going to tell me which of their products meet the previous criteria that I chose. Now, right off the bat, you'll see it does serve up into our, our visualizer window here. And don't freak out. This is just a visualizer. This isn't actually showing the Revit model itself. Uh, so this is meant to communicate what's happening. The actual output is a system family. Uh, so we'll just have the layers. Now, we do yeah, have yeah, the stuff. We'll not include the studs is what you mean. Yeah, we do have the stud families available, and that'll come with the download too. If you do want to increase the level of detail and start to model your studs, you have that option as well. So from there, we can start to layer on and, and move a little quick, quicker. So I'll just uh, add something like some gypsum. And you'll see anytime this little properties icon uh, lights up green, that means there are additional decisions that I can make. So if I go in here, uh, this is where we get into our data layer. And so we can actually start to call out more specific uh, pieces of this uh, and even start to specify things like trim. Now, you don't have to do that, uh, but it will serve up an RFA uh, in addition to that if you want to get to that level of detail. For some layers, we also have fasteners uh, that can be written into the system family as data. But you can see uh, it makes this really easy for me to uh, go through and uh, build out my layers. So now I'm going to put an exterior layer, and you'll see here's the marker for interior and then your core. And that will set up the way Revit uh, is going to serve that to you. So that's the really nice thing about that is it, it, it's doing those layers for you. So anything you want to be considered in your core, you do make sure you move it there. Um, so I'll put this on my exterior layer and just start to build some of this out. Now on my interior layer, maybe I want to, I'm, I'm going to make another layer of jib so I can clone. So these are some of the tools that are more efficient than the wall builder in Revit, obviously. Uh, so I can add paint. Um, now paint will come through. Uh, you do have the option to either show it as a, a membrane layer, or you can assign thickness after the fact if you want to get to that level of precision. Uh, but there are over 800,000 uh, unique finishes and materials available now in Vimsmith. So uh, it's a really great resource for these types of products. You can see all the major paint companies are here. And we can even go into the properties and further edit uh, from the full catalog of 2,500 colors from Sherwin Williams. Uh, so we can get very specific with that. And those are all render ready with full assets, uh, you know, and all of that. Cool. So. Uh that's on the web do you have a rivet plugin as well we do have a rivet plugin as well and you can download that from the vimsmith site now to build a forge build uh right now you need to do that in the web browser but it mm -hmm. will serve it to the plugin after you're done via yeah. uh the tool called my vimsmith which we have uh running in the background so i'll i'll show that in a moment here okay good so you can see i can add brick i can add stone uh here's a good canadian brand for you nick uh, yeah, 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 Permacon, yeah. Yeah. So I, I have some of the their um, their bricks on my house. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see you can even add things like air layers and you know assign that thickness. Uh, you know if you want to put an air gap in there. Uh, so you can see as I'm doing that, then it is making that air gap for me. So you can see that'll come through in the model as well. Uh, this little explode button will enable us to see the, the full build as we go down as well. So you can sign up to explode that, which is just a bit of fun, honestly. <laughs> uh, 
So then we can name this anything we want. We'll call it Nix wall. Uh, and again, we can drag and drop layers as we see fit. You know, this is all very friendly from an interface standpoint. Uh, now, if you didn't want to build it out layer by layer the way I just did, you can go over here to the side panel and you can see we've got these pre-built system starters, which are all from different manufacturers. So you can see all these different manufacturers have different tested systems, whether it's fire ratings, NFPA, uh, UL, STC, sound values, you know, these kinds of things. These are all ready to go for you uh, ahead of time. So I won't do that because it's going to wipe out what I just built. But uh, if we, for example, chose homosote, I can see here's a U341 with an STC of 60 with double wood stud bearing wall. If I click on that, I'm not going to do it now because it'll wipe it out, but it'll push that in uh, into the tool. So when you're on uh, places like Vintimic Market, you see these pre-built uh, pre walls, um, you'll see them layered in with the rest of the search results. It's gonna push you into Forge uh, with those pre-built walls. So they come up in the search results with the rest of the products, but it is gonna bring you into the Forge Builder tools. So that's kind of a nice tie-in between the two. Uh, but back to that, then when I'm done, uh, just going to hit build, but before I do that, I'm just going to check to see what I chose. You'll see there's a little bit of information on each of the different uh, products so that I can see that. And we do have these nice little videos that uh, become available based on what you click on. So then I'll just hit build, and it's going to spit out that uh, system into uh, our tool called My Bimsmith, which is where these configurations live. And uh, the nice thing about this is you can actually keep these all uh, sort of in a row here in a private stream. And so you can see these are all just different systems that I've built uh, through the years, walls, floors, ceilings, roofs. You can also share into this from Bimsmith Market uh, by clicking Add to My Bimsmith. And so what that means then is you can start to curate these uh, different uh, projects uh, or project types. So if you wanted to serve those up, you could. Uh, so if you built a bunch of configurations on Bimsmith Forge, and you wanted to share them for wide, or you wanted to share them with your colleague for a project, or even I, I've heard of people sharing these with customers to review the selections, uh, you can you can certainly do so. So anyway, here's Nick's wall. Uh, we've got it here. It again knows exactly what I've chosen, uh, what products I've chosen. It's got backlinks to the manufacturer data. But then I'm just going to grab this. It's going to give me the Revit file, the AutoCAD file, three-part specs, if they're available, any relevant cut sheets, and just hit download. And uh, it's just going to give me that zip file. <clears throat> yeah, wh while this is loading, maybe we, we can have time for a, a quick question. Uh, yeah, Ning, no. Ning asks, is that Forge tool based on Autodesk Forge services? If so, no, then how so to tackle Forge Viewer? Yeah, yeah no, con no connection to Autodesk Forge or any of their tools. This is uh, completely homegrown uh, by the Bim Smith team. Yeah, and, that, and then John Pearson made a joke. I thought this was called Bim Smith Platform Services. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Thanks for that. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, pretty good. I don't know why they, they should call it APS. That has a better ring to it. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now uh, in the background, um, I'm you know getting this download. As we said, you have a folder with collateral for each of the brands that you chose. So in here is going to be like cut sheets and things like that. You know, so you've got any of the uh, relevant uh, documents. For what you expect. Now you don't have to download that. You can just get the router file, or you can just get the CAD file. But yeah, you know, then it's also going to give you your bump map and your your seamless image. Uh, you know, if if that's something that you want. Um, so anyway, uh, from there, um, let's bring this over. Got multiple screens going here, so. So now you've got your, your wall type. You can see it brought through that color. 
can see it's coming through. And then uh, from there, we can look at it in plan. It's got our native file here. And then if I edit this, you'll see that it does come through with all the relevant data um, that, we, that we wanted there. And then if I start to cut a section, I can actually use material tags, which is super exciting from my perspective. So if I wanted to start to do a wall section or a wall detail, the data is already there for me. And we do, under our annotations portion of the website, have uh, custom uh, material tags that are available. And if you want to use those uh, with our tools, you can do that. But they're, the ones out of the box from Revit will also do it. Um, so you can see it's it's calling that out appropriately. Right. So that's that's part of the fun of it. And um, you know, like I said, if you uh, want to store these then on the on the site, you can uh, you can do that, or you can you know pull them into your content management tool of choice. All right, that's uh, that's really cool. So people try that that forge, not to be confused with uh, <laughs> formally. Uh, what is that? Oh, yes, that's yes. from services. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> uh, there's a question from Milo that asks, how does Bim Smith warn their product in terms of accuracy if design error happened? Yeah, so, I mean, we're just a content creator. So we pass along uh, the manufacturers. You know, they're available to help. Um, but as far as accuracy, that's part of our user agreement that as an architect, you're ultimately responsible for checking the accuracy. Now, that being said, our files do go through, you know, very vigorous testing, not only from our team, but also from the manufacturers that we work for. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a big part of what we do. But at the end of the day, it is much like any portion of construction or architecture. It is uh, your liability to check that your drawings are complete and accurate. Uh, yeah, good. So do you want to work? Uh... I think the show will will bring it to an end uh, shortly. Do you want to mention uh, Swatchbox? Been working. Yeah, on that sure. Recently? So uh, we got started with Swatchbox around 2018. Um, we saw the need for taking what we learned about digital assets from manufacturers and then tying that into a physical asset like a sample. And so um, you can see we've actually integrated it into Bensmith. So if you click that samples available button, it's going to show you the products that uh, also have a sample available. Um, so when we go in here and look at any of these products, uh, alongside the Revit download, you can also get a, a physical sample and it's shipped on a next day or two day ship. Uh, so over here, you'll see, it's like this is bare paint. Uh, we've got the Revit file for that paint library, but then we also have this order sample button. And from there, you can uh, choose uh, the colors that you want to receive a paint chip in the mail for. So. Uh, if you combine multiple products, it'll come in one box. So from a sustainability standpoint, it's unparalleled in terms of reducing waste. Um, the other thing you can do is go to swatchbox.com, and we have a standalone site where you can find uh, other products. Maybe they're on Bimsmith, maybe they're not, but uh, have a complete library of finishes that you can order physical samples for. So all of these are available to you as physical samples. Uh, and this is also available in Europe. So it's not just limited to the US. Um, so something to consider there. And you know, it's great when you can get uh, the digital asset and then match it up with the physical. Because you know, as good as rendering engines are, there is no replacement for holding a piece of brick in your hands and helping your client make a decision as it relates to that. So more on that integration as time progresses, we're building uh, all sorts of tie-ins uh, between the two tools. So that is uh, available in the US right now? It's available in the US, Canada, and Europe. Oh, it's in Canada too. Oh, interesting. I'll try it, I think. Yeah, because I mean, I I, I went there. I've, when you want to get sample, you have to find the guy and yep. try to call him and then yeah. it's a mess. He's not there. He's in holidays, so you cannot yeah. get your sample in time. So that's a pretty good idea, actually. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, okay, let's uh, try to see if there are other questions. I think we went through pretty much of the questions. Yeah, anything else you wanted to add? No, I, w I would just, you know, reiterate what I said before, you know, uh, if you're not currently looking at manufactured content as a resource, give it another try. Uh, yeah. Check out a credible uh, source, make sure that they have good processes in place. Uh, nobody's perfect. You know, I'm sure there's stuff out there too, you know, on our site, you know, anything can supply, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a worthwhile endeavor to think about how we're making specification uh, decisions in our industry through Revit content mm -hmm. uh, and that can actually yep. lead to better decisions from a material selection standpoint, because where we're going is better tools for mm -hmm. consuming data. And if we don't have good sources for data, those tools aren't going to be that helpful, whether it's energy analysis or quantity takeoffs mm -hmm. or more accurate bidding, you know, these things can all factor in if they're structured properly. So, um, I would just challenge the industry to continue to look at yep. uh, these types of tools as a, a viable answer to, to move other goals uh, in the firm forward. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, it's the dream of BIM, right? It's yeah. the, the dream of BIM is that you can you could pick objects and the specs would be done automatically. You don't have to worry about that. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe we need a universal uh, uh, manufacturers content declaration something like that so that not only you and BIM content follow these rules but other websites as well so we know yeah, that there's sure. no John content out there sure <clears throat> all right so uh, that was great that was super interesting looking forward to see the uh, the holidays so for people not in the know uh, for the last couple of years the BIM Smith has run holidays family holidays competition this is super interesting. So looking forward to, to it being announced again this year. And, yep, uh, we'll, we'll be announcing that uh, right around Thanksgiving time here in the US. Okay. So, uh, keep an eye out for that. Nice big prizes again this year. And it's just been a lot of fun uh, to to uh, to do that every year. So. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really cool. So a couple of things to, uh, to, to say before putting an end to the show. Uh, next week, the next episode of Rivet Pure Live, with Bill Allen and Benjamin Guler from Evolve Lab. Uh, and the title of the show will be, Should You Automate BIM? It's, I think it's the first time there's a question in the title. Um, but yeah, Evolve Lab, they've been doing amazing work. Uh, one of their plugins takes a SketchUp model and reproduce it in Revit using, uh, not just importing geometry, but, but by using system families. And they have lots of really interesting tools so we'll move a little bit away from the topics of family for this one. It will be more about automation, but this should be extremely interesting. So this is next week at the same time, Wednesday, 3 p.m. Should you automate BIM with Bill Allen and Benjamin Guler from Evolve Lab. Um, uh, thanks again to Avail for sponsoring this episode of Rivet Pure Live. Uh, check out um avail uh by using the link in the video description and once again would you like to have a course with me and 24 other students to learn advanced tricks and strategies to master families if it is the case i'll paste it once again in the chat <clears throat> once again in the chat yeah this is a new experiment i'm trying but a cohort based course uh, which means it will be interaction with the student. It will be community uh, challenges, homework. Uh, but before like officially launching and opening the opening the registration, I'm doing a survey to be sure. And if you complete the survey, you'll be in the waiting list. And I want to know like what are is the skill level of most people interested in the course, what topics they want to learn. So please fill out the survey. It's only two two minutes, and it will help me a lot. And um, uh, back to you, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> thanks yeah, for just, me. yeah, thanks for being here. And uh, thanks to everyone in the chat. And check out Bim Smith. They have great families. I recommend that to all my clients when they're looking for content. Uh, so thanks, Ben. Thanks and, a lot. Have a great day, everyone. All right. See you next week. Bye. <laughs>